a decision that I don't want to be the average Christian. So you better learn to start trusting God that his plans for you that really are for your good. Even though storms may come, we know that our battle is won. We're going from victory to victory. We're going from victory to victory. You ready for the word today? Come on. Now, we're going we're gonna to preach together today. Um, there is, I think it's about two in every three marriages today are ending in divorce. It doesn't have to be that way. Obey the basic rules. Number one, the Bible tells us you should not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. Um, if you are unequally yoked, but you can be unequally yoked in church as well. You take a woman who's really ambitious, really driven, really motivated, and she marries a man who lacks even the basic motivation to get out of his bed. That's unequally yoked. So when you yoke yourself to somebody, you have to make sure they're on the same level as you are. Are, are you with me? So if we do the basic stuff, then it's going to work for us. Amen. Now, we're going to be talking about singles. We're going to be talking about dating. But it all comes back around to marriage as well. So we're talking about marriage, dating, and we're including the singles. How many happily married people are in here? Would you marry the same person again? Some of you never answered. That's... Would you marry the same person again? Yes. Amen. Wow. <laughs> should, we, should we move on? I think so. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Um, this morning we want to talk about, um, we want to talk about um, the stages leading up into a relationship um, because it's, it's not enough to, to just talk about marriage when you're there, but there's things... Um, that we can communicate with you that will help you to make sure that you're selecting the right partner. Um, I know that not everybody listens. Um, some of you will still do it your own way, but um, for us, we want to be able to give you the information that will save you a lot of heartache. Um, I don't know about you, but I rather would learn textbook style than from the school of experience. Some people, it doesn't matter what you say to them, they insist on going through a school of experience and you, you get some hard knocks there. Um, so it's always important to um, gather the right information so that when you're choosing somebody that you're going to spend the rest of your life with. Told you, say it out loud because it really kind of re resonates. The rest of my life the rest with. Of my life. That life can be 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, however, till death you depart, basically. That's a long time with one person. And if you knew, you know, it's kind of like us girls, when you see a box of chocolates, you're like, which one? Which one? If you knew you only could pick one, you're not just going to grab anything. You're going to make sure you pick your favorite. Amen? So when we're choosing somebody that we're going to spend the rest of our lives with, that we're going to have a family with, it's important that we, our selection is right. Because not everything that glitters is gold. Some of it's brass. So, but also, whilst we're identifying this, um, talking about what you should look for before you get married, this is also going to help you to look for or understand why you're having trouble in your yes. marriage now. Yeah. Because your foundation, some of you, you've married, you've married someone didn't God, God didn't call you to marry, you've married someone without gathering information, you've gathered someone, you, you've married someone without learning or trying to understand their background, where they've been, where they're coming from, what their belief systems are, what their cultural differences are, and you've gone into something and you didn't really understand, and now you're paying the price for it. And you don't have the answer. So whilst we're talking about this, hopefully it's going to give you the opportunity to examine where you're at as well. You get that. Okay, so let's kick off. We're starting with dating. 
And, you know, we, we've said this before in relationships. Dating doesn't stop because you're married. Um, the courtship that you, you did prior to marriage, you need to maintain. The courtship is what keeps the romance alive. It's what keeps the marriage fresh. So we don't stop dating. Amen? But one of the things that, one of the categories that we need to understand before um, we get into seriousness, and uh, even as Christians, don't get serious so quick. It's like one date, you're serious. You're talking marriage. That's nonsense. That's, that's foolishness. That's how can you? How can you? Yeah. I mean, how can you make a decision? I mean, they, you know, you talk about love at first sight, but really it's not. It's an infatuation. It's whatever it is. But how can you make a decision on one date that this is who I want to spend the rest of my life with? Amen. So keep your brain, keep your intellect intact. Can you say amen? amen? So gathering pertinent information is a key element when you start seeing someone. So one of those things is um, the questions that you can have that you can compare to when you start, when you start um, seeing somebody. Because, you know, communication is an important aspect of whether you want to spend the rest of your life with someone. And so one of the things you can ask them or her or find out for yourself, because sometimes people tell you something and it's t so not true. Does he or she have a relationship with God? That's really, that's your anchor. This is the center of any relationship that you have. If God is the center, then it doesn't matter what you face or what you go through, it will come out okay. If God doesn't start off as being the center then everything else, if you've ever done pottery, everything else, you'll spend the rest of your life being off-center. That's the struggles and the problems, the unnecessary. Everything else will be off-center. So it is important, whether you may regard it or not, that God is the center of his or her life. Well, basically, you've got to understand, if, if a man or woman does not know how to love the creator, God who made you, if I don't know how to love and honor God, how can I then love and honor his creation? How, how can I do that? Because if I don't have a revelation, and some of you, you, you think you can change a man to, to be a godly person. Listen, if me, my love for God comes from within, it's not because I like the woman. It's not because I want something from her. It's not because I like to, to get something or people think I'm somebody. My love for God is genuine. And if you're going to go out with someone with the intention of dating or marrying, and they do not reverence God or love God, you cannot marry someone that does not love your Jesus. You cannot spend your life with someone who is irreverent to your God. If a man says, we can, we can love God, but we don't have to go to church, he tells you if you love him, you must do what he says. And he says you should not forsake the assembling of yourself together as the man of some is. So number one, you cannot marry somebody. You can, but it's going to be a hard road for you. So if you want a marriage that's going to last, the, the thing that keeps your marriage going is your commitment to God. Because I love God, I'm going to treat my wife in a godly manner. Because I fear God. I understand the scriptures that says, if I, don't, if I don't honor her, my prayers will be hindered. So because I fear God and I love God, I will love her the way God wants me to love her. That means I'm not going to beat her. I'm not going to abuse her. I'm going to love her. I'm going to cherish her. If you marry someone that doesn't think like that, then he has no motivation to love you in a godly fashion. But here's how it goes, you know, because you have to know this for yourself because I know that my husband loves me, but he treats me the way I want to be treated when he's on point with God. Yes. Now, if, if that's not there to begin with, you know, because we all have times where we're up and down in our walk with God, but I know that the, the more time he spends with God, I benefit. The closer he's walking with God, I get to benefit from that. So I, I've experienced the difference, and this is somebody that loves God. So if I'm starting out with somebody that isn't even there, 
I'm in trouble. This is a man that loves God, that pursues God. But I, I benefit and I notice a huge difference when he's on it with God. That's why I'll be like, honey, go lock yourself in a room for a week, a month. Because I know, yes, I'm, I'm paying a price, sacrifice. But when he comes back, guess what? I'm going to get treated because he's been with the father. He's been with my daddy that knows me inside and out. That I'm the apple of his eye. Guess what? If he's been hanging around with my dad that adores me, he's only going to come out and adore me even more. Amen? So that's a, that's a really key thing, men and women. She must love God because I know if I didn't love God the way I did, number one, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't push him to, go, to God. Men, you need a wife that knows how to pray for you. You need a wife that loves God. Because if she loves the Father, she's going to love you. If she's got that kind of relationship going on with God, you don't have to. There's a, there's a scripture in Proverbs 31 says that the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. When you have a woman that loves God, guys, when you find that wife, not any woman, it says find a wife, he that finds a wife. When you find that quality in a woman, you never have to be looking behind you because she's got your back. She's got your back in the natural. She's got your back in the spiritual. So we recognize that God is a pivotal, pivotal point in gathering information. So you need to be looking for yourself. But these Don't are, just these ask are, questions. These are basic stuff. Mm. Basic things like, secondly, church, church attendance. attendance. If, you, if, if, you, if you're dating somebody that doesn't go to church regular, you are seeing signs of inconsistency. So if a man can't be committed or a woman can't be committed to God, listen, basic Christianity, we should have all this packed down. Church attendance is basic. On Sundays, I'm in church. On Wednesdays, I'm in church. Prayer meeting, we won't be here tomorrow because obviously I have made plans. And the single ones will be here. Shandala mama robo sokote. I pull him down. I pull him down. We're not pulling no devil down. I'll pull him into my life. See, the, the thing is, prayer meeting, anyone who doesn't like to pray is a, is a dangerous person. Yeah. I'm not talking about a danger as in murder, but I'm talking about a person who does not like to pray is a person who does not have a revelation of who God is, because prayer changes things. So, basic church attendance, commitment, loyalty, faithfulness. If someone can't be in church every week, then there's a strong chance they'll not be committed to you permanently. This is a person who will be looking for escape hatches when things go wrong. And trust me, things do go wrong. You will argue, you'll have debates. So if someone is not consistently in church, I would not even, if you come to me and say to me, I want to marry so-and-so and he's not in church every week, I'll say, no, I'm not married. I will not partake of your sin. Because when it goes wrong, you'll say, you should have told me. I'll tell you before. You can leave the church. But at least I've told you, my hands are clean. You see it? So basic church attendance. Next, we have commitment. Mm. Uh, commitment is something all marriages require. Yes. Yes. It is, it's commitment, right? Mm. Um, we're committed to this thing. Mm. Next, April is 36 years. We've this been April. married. This April. This April. What's next April is this April. No, it's not. This April hasn't come yet. That's next that's April. April. That's why it's okay. April. All right, April this year. <laughs> You see, arguments come. You see that? Now, we can take this just... I, I, no, we can't. We can. We, I can. We could turn this into an argument. What do you mean? By but, yourself. Okay, by myself. Okay. So, 36 years, it takes a commitment. Mm. <clears throat> it takes a dedication. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, ladies, uh, men, if the person you're looking to marry or married to is not committed... Mm. is not dedicated. And one of the first mm. places I look for commitment is church. Because if you're committed to God, mm. then I know you'll be committed. Yeah. But if you're inconsistent with church, mm. you, you've been in church for years, you don't get involved in church, mm. you don't do anything, you're the type that will not do anything at home. Mm. It, it's, it happens as it happens here. You know, I told you that the, as goes the home, so goes, so goes the, church. the church. The same order that's on your home will be the same order come on the church. There are, there are men who in this room today 
who have made zero plans for their wives tomorrow. Here's the excuse. I don't believe in Valentine's. Well, she does. The devil does not celebrate love. That's an amen, right? The devil doesn't do anything that causes marriages to work. He's come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He's come to cause divorce. So anything that enhances your marriage is worthy of pursuit. So you, you, but you know what? We look around today and what causes marriages to break up? Lack of commitment. Because when you're committed to something, you stick with it. You know, commitment isn't just while the weather's fair. Commitment is through good times, through bad times. So um, c the basis of looking for fruit at, at the stage before you get to marriage is, are they committed in church? And I'm talking co not just committed in attending, but are they involved? Have they got involved? There's plenty to do. There's, it's not like we've got, there's not enough work for everyone to get involved in. There's a department that everybody can get involved in. So one of the keys for looking is in church, are they committed? Are they involved? Are they involved in, a, in an area of the ministry? Another thing is consistency. You know, have you been married for more than five years? Let's see your hand. Are you still in love? No, I mean like properly in love. Like... Do you look at her, I mean Fifi, and do you look at her and you, you go boom, boom, boom. You feel that? You, you look at her, she walks across the room and you look at her bottom and you say, Jesus, I thank you. Mm, my Lord. You do that. TV, you're watching, you can say, but you do the same thing and you're not even married. Now, you go to get this place, you look at her, you see a wife walk across the room and you go boom, boom. Now, now we, we, we all act shocked, but let me tell you something, girls. If you've lost that, if he's not looking, you can walk past him naked and he didn't notice you. Something's gone wrong. <laughs> Something has no, gone no, drastically no, no, no. wrong. She's gone to another level. <laughs> <laughs> I just says her bottom, she's stripped the woman off and gone naked. I didn't say that. Well, I did, because you know what? Every, you, this, is, this is when you know you still got it. This is when you know you still got it married. 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 This is singles, you're omitted from this. But married. You shouldn't be able to walk past him without some hand. You know how it is. This hand reaches out to grab after you. If the hand stopped... You lost, you, something got lost. You need to go back and find it. Maybe you need to lose a head wrap. <laughs> Maybe you need to lose a big, we're not even on flannel nighties now, we're on track suits. I saw one person, I know they're in here, there's this, you know these baby grow things? You know those all-in-ones that zip up, this teddy, what's, what's it called? What? It's this all-in-one contraption. And I, the person's single and I said, you need to, I says, how many have you got? She, <laughs> she had a few. I says, you need to make a bonfire and you need to put that thing on it. That will kill your marriage. You can't be married and go to bed in tracksuit or all in one teddies, whatever you call it. So we need to backtrack at what is it that we've lost to keep our marriage alive. Maybe we've put on a little bit too much weight and we, we need to recognize just because you have a baby doesn't mean you let your body go. Moderate your eating. Do some exercise. Can you say amen? But you take care of your body, right? Just because you've got a ring on your finger, it doesn't mean that he's, his eyes have glazed over and he doesn't see nobody else. What is it that he... That what was it about you that attracted him to you in the first place? If I'm now twice the size that I was when he, and you do put on weight, I've put on a lot of weight since to the size I was, 
Um, but you, you still take care of yourself to the best of your ability. I'm a grandmother. I'm 54 this year. But you know what? I'll, I don't love exercise. If you were to ask me if I love it, I don't love it. But I do it because I need to stay in shape. I want to take care of myself for me and for him. So letting myself go and keep not bothering with my hair and not bothering my, with my skin. I'm not keeping up the maintenance of how I used to try to present myself before when we were dating. So just because I have a ring on my finger now doesn't mean I let all that go. Kind of went off. No, but when we go back to consistency, a lot of us, the one thing we're consistent with is our inconsistency. Um, it is, a lot of us are very consistent with being inconsistent. Mm. And when you get married, see, when you get married, it doesn't stop there, it just begins there. So what we have to do is, you know, I see marriages, they're dying. Some of them are already dead. The people are together because you become inconsistent. It is not, this is not the picture. Walk up the aisle, get married, get pregnant, have children, work, church, home, work, church, home, home, church, work. Put on weight, don't take care of anything, you go in your house, you, you're wearing the same old things, you look in the same old way, you stop taking care of yourself, and you're, you become climatized to each other. Listen to me, married couple, some of you in here, what you need is a revamp. You need a makeover. You need to go back to your first love, where you fell in love. And one of the things is, because we become inconsistent, we stop dating. You can't have a good marriage if you stop dating. I'm sorry, but you cannot be happily married if all you do is go to work, come to church, go home, go to work, come to church, go home. It takes a bit more than that. It takes some romance. It takes some dinner dates. It takes some sitting in the park, feeding the ducks. It talks about, it, it means talking about your dreams, your goals, your vision, your hopes, your, your, the things you're looking forward to. You have to be consistent. You, you've got to be consistent with dating. You, you, before, 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 this is what we do. Before we get married, I'll never see my wife without makeup. When, before she gets married, before we get married, she's always looking fine. Always looking fine. And then all of a sudden, because you get the ring, you think the ring, the ring is not glued to your finger, honey. It can come off. And you think because you do this, you can have children and you can just let yourself go. Men, you think you just let yourself go and you think she's going to love you just because you said, I do. And you're inconsistent. You, you, you're not romantic. You stop growing. You stop trying. She's looking for love and you're too busy loving something else. Loving your computer, loving your work, and all of a sudden the milkman looks appealing. Someone gives her a compliment, and all of a sudden, because you're not feeding her desire, her passion, someone else gives her a compliment, and all of a sudden she's like, it's so not, she's not used to it that this person knocks her off her guard. And suddenly it's like, when you, do you know, have you, have you ever fasted um, calories? Not calories, carbohydrates. Yes. Do you ever fasted carbohydrates? I did this one time. I fasted carbohydrate for two weeks. I done that Atkins diet. You know the one that, where the man died from heart attack from all that fried stuff. <laughs> I, I fasted carbohydrates. And I had fried egg, fried this. And you think, oh, meat, meat, meat. Just eat as much meat. And after a while, you don't want no more meat. Two weeks of this. You know what I did? I stopped at the petrol station. I got two giant Mars bars. I sat in my car. If you'd film me, you'd think I was a cannibal. Ah. <laughs> I said, this, this diet can't be good. Because if I'm behaving like this, I pass petrol station all the time. I don't buy Mars bars. I didn't, I didn't chew them like two chews and it was in your stomach. So this is, you know why? I was starved of something that my body needed. So when you starve each other of the affection you need, yes. you crave it and you take it from somewhere else. So someone you would probably never even pay attention to yes. Yes. will suddenly get your attention. Yes. 
in the office, you know, you ladies, you, you think you just carry on the way you want, and here's these girls in the office, and they're looking fine. And they're, they're like, you know, they, they smell nice. You smell a cooking. They smell a jadua. They, 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 they smell all kind of nice perfume. You wear, you wear those tracksuits that come down. You've got one bottom and double bottom. The bottom comes to your kneecap and the man comes home. You, you are killing your marriage. But the thing is, you're not doing that while you're dating. Because when you're dating, they don't see you look like that. He thinks, he thinks this is it for life. I'm telling you. And we all need that. A, a, a man needs that affirmation. He, when, you, when, you, when you're dating, you're saying, you're such a good man. I love you so much. I, I just want to marry you. And you're saying that you look so fine. I know the pastor says uh, that I understand now why they say when we engage or when we're dating, it's the most dangerous time. Because, baby, when I look at you, my knees are shaking like a shaking all over. You, you, you say, God, but what happens to that after you get married? You don't, you don't say to each other, I love you. There's a way to say I love you and there's a way to say I love you. I love you. Oh, you do? I heard you say that to the dog last night. <laughs> Carry on. But, you know, uh, you know, listening to Pastor there, there is something when you serve men, whether they're saved or unsaved, um, there is something about that, I don't know if, uh, I believe God obviously put it in a man, but there's something in a man um, that wants the woman on his arm to look good. It's not, but it's not just any woman. I know it's not because, just any woman, but, me, but the, me, but the basis show. of it. Yeah, no, but watch this. You see women, um, we, we were driving somewhere the other morning, right? It was six in the morning, and we saw prostitutes on the street. One of them had, I don't know if you saw it, maybe you don't have, women's notice. eyes don't see that. Her chest was like, like someone had stuck an ear thing underneath her jumper and pumped it because it was coming out. It looks like it was going to come out. You, you get the picture. idea. Now, now, you see women with skin tight clothes, they have a nice figure, but mini skirt. We will look, brothers. We have a look, but none of us want you on our, no, not you, want her on our arm, because that will be shameful for us. But what we want is we want a lady. We want to be seen with a lady. That means your dress should not be attracting the attention of other men in a lustful way. They should look at you and say, we feel proud then when they look at you and we know they desire you, but we have you. But they're not looking at you because your clothes are revealing. That's shameful for, in that right? For us, that's shameful. So what we are looking for is like, see, me and you can walk down the road. And that's nice. I like that. That doesn't embarrass me. You get that? So you have to take care of yourself. If, if your marriage, take out some photographs the way you were when you get, got married, whether three years ago, five years ago. I looked at a picture. And some of, some of the girls, you actually look better now than you did four or five years ago. You should be getting better. If you look at pictures of her when she was 18, 19, 20, she actually looks better now than when we were in our teens. Because she has maturity and she has finesse and she has style and she has class and she has character. I say amen, yeah. man. Amen. Come on. That's amen. good stuff. But <laughs> Amen. But I just, you know, but I, I really want us to get this, ladies. There is something um, that a man um, that makes him feel good um, in the way. There's something my husband would always say to me. He says, "I can, I can take you anywhere." Um, he felt. He felt. He feels that um, he can carry me into any um, environment. environment, and he feels good. And I know men like to feel good about the, the woman on their arm. And I say that to say we need to take care of ourselves so that we are uh, portraying a good reflection that this man takes care of me. And I'm assuming 
that you, you take care of your wives. I said this to, the, to him the other day uh, about somebody that I was observing. It's nice to see, it's not meant to be condescending, it's nice to see a kept woman. Let a, me woman br- a woman who's loved, taken uh, care of. I need to define it. A kept woman is in, you see this guy taking care of her, buying her nice gifts and really taking care of her. You don't see that too often. Let me move on. No, let me, let me go, because I want to go to the things that, I want to go to the things that causes breakups in marriage. And some of you will be experiencing this right now. Um, in living in the United Kingdom, it is not, not, it's not even United Kingdom now, it's Great Britain. Soon it will just be Britain, because not much great about it anymore. But where we are now, we're living in a place where there are so many different cultures and it's without saying some of us are going to marry into another culture. How, how many have ever, how many are married into another someone from another country? It's it has its problems. Would you agree? You say no, because one of the things we do is when when we when we meet somebody we love we're in love. Oh, I'm in love. Oh, I'm so in love. But when you're in that state of mind, you you actually temporarily lost your mind because you do things without thinking. For instance, if I marry someone from another culture, I have to ask a question, what is or how is this going to affect us in the future? So if I marry, I'm from St. Vincent, so I marry a Ghanaian or a Zimbabwean or a Nigerian or whoever, and nothing wrong with marrying them. She's from Jamaica, I'm from St. Vincent. Um, so we, our cultures are not m- that much different, just different islands. They call us small island, and I don't know what we call you, but I'll think of something. But <laughs> they call us smally, small island. Now, with us marrying, because we're both from the Caribbean, it, it wasn't that much of an adjustment, because we, we still have the same food, and because none of us are really cultural as such, we don't carry the culture of the Caribbean or the West Indies. None of us have that. We'll eat the food, but we don't have to eat the food. You know, Akin saltfish is okay when you haven't had it for a while, but we can't eat every week or every month, once in a while. So we, none of us had that cultural thing. But some people carry a culture. They really carry the culture. And some of you don't ask about it. You don't question the culture when you marry someone from another culture. For instance, how you raise your children. Because you could be married right now, and because of the culture, how you relate to your in-laws. Yeah. How, how your in-laws relate to you. Yeah. What role do your in-laws have in your life, in your marriage? Yeah. These are things we don't ask about. Because in, my, in our marriage, our in-laws have no, no authority at all in our relationship. But you know what? Even within the same culture, you're from the same country, there is a culture within a culture. The yes, culture is. is in how you were raised in your household. And um, that can play a major problem in your relationship if you don't understand the cultural upbringing is in how he was raised, how you were raised. So you've got to understand and take the time. Can you, because you know, with culture, you need to find out can I live with that? Mm. And a lot of things, you know, we may see somebody, we may think, oh, they're really westernized. But you know, culture manifests when children come along. That's or one of the or marriages, Women. children. Then the culture begins to seep out. Because let me tell you this, it doesn't matter what anyone says, I am who I was raised. What was taught to me, what was modeled to me in the, my growing up, is very much how I will act out from. Um, How my parents were with us. I still, I'm 54 this year, but I've, as much as I never considered it, I found myself using the same template to raise my children. The same things that we didn't particularly like when we were kids. You know how they used to have you. You find you do it to your kids. And we pass on things. Why? Because that is how I was raised. That was what was modeled, that behavior. So if I saw my, um, my mother, for example, um, being the dominant factor in, 
my parents' marriage and always abusive to my father and shouting at him and putting him down. And she basically wore the trousers. Guess what I would have turned out to be? But every, every country has a culture. Yes, Whether it's not yeah. black Africa or West Indies, that Australia has a culture. There's surfboards and sea. That's the culture. You've got American, they have their own culture. Mm. Eat as much as you like. That's, that's a culture. That's why you, you get 72-inch um, chest, um, the different cultures. Every, every country has a culture, but it doesn't, you know, when we're just casual with people, it doesn't matter. It's when we commit to people yes. and when yeah. we decide that we're going to make a life together, mm. i.e., how you raise your children. Here's mm. a major problem. Yeah. Because I see, like, when we got married, mm. she thought she should smack the children. I said, no, that's abuse. You don't mm. smack the children. I was beaten. Don't beat our children. But then I realized, I got woke up and realized they need a good, good beating. <laughs> <laughs> so... But in my way, I was, I was thinking, let's not beat the children. And those of you who believe in that doctrine, you're waiting for a wake-up call. Because if you don't beat them, they'll browbeat you with worry. So the difference comes when it comes to raising, like naming the baby, like picking a house. Who, does, who names the baby? I figured, well, if she had the birth pains, she should at least have the choice. That's my figuring. You know, I did, I was in there, I, w I did all the motions, <laughs> I did all of that, but I didn't feel any pain. So I, I, my belief system is that, well, if she's born the pain, let her name the child. For instance, picking a house. We will look at the house together, and, but when it comes to the interior of the house, even the birds dress their house. So I don't know colors. I don't know, uh, you know, pulling out swatches of, of cloth. That gives me a headache. It's, it's too much. It taxes my brain. I feel like I'm going to have a crash, a crisis. If I have to start thinking about colors of sofas and colors of curtains, anything will do. So what I do, I recognize in, in what I believe is we should leave that to the woman. Now, you may say, well, no, no, I disagree. I have a better style than her. Well, it doesn't show up in your dress. But however, um, but then we start, it starts creating problems. And can you see how a lot of problems could come in? Jesus said this to the, to the, 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 the scribes and Pharisees. He says, your traditions, your traditions in Mark chapter 7, he says, your traditions have made the word of God null and void. Your traditions, watch this, your traditions, the traditions of men have made the word of God null and void. You've, you've disarmed the word of God with your tradition. That means your tradition can also make, if it can make the word of God null and void, in other words, it will not work for you. It doesn't mean it's not working for anybody else, but for you it stopped working. And if you're so bound by your traditions, you can also make your marriage null and void or inactive. And you can actually remove all the love and all the romance from your marriage because you insist on holding on to something you don't even understand. Because you say, this is the way my father done it. This is the way my mother done it. Well, did it work for them? Where did they get it from? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from Father of lights. Now, if it's from, if it's, you say, but our culture, it's in our culture, but is it in God's word? Because God's, God's word is our new culture. So if it's not in the scriptures, let's put it to one side. Amen. I'm so going to call a couple of you ladies in a moment. So get ready. Be ready to speak. So some of the pointers that you can uh, make a note of is when you're gathering information. This isn't, you haven't given your heart away yet. This is where you gather information and then you make a decision based on the information that you have. So it's what are the cultural differences? How was he or she raised? What role did their father play in the home? Very important. Because especially in, a, in, in the role of a man, um, the, the role that the father modeled to, to that man will very much dictate what, how he's going to be. Can, can I explain something about this role, role thing in the home? When my father and mother were married, my father worked and my mother so it was a standard thing 
<clears throat> when my father got home, his dinner was ready. I've never seen my father wash a dish. I've never seen him in the kitchen except when he's boiling his ham or when the cake was just cooked and he wanted a slice. But I've never seen him actually active in the kitchen, like sweeping the floor, washing the dishes, because he, he worked and my mother stayed home. Men, listen to me. Today, most of our wives work. Most of our wives work. So the roles have changed a little bit. If, if, I didn't, if, if I went out to work every day and she stayed home, I would expect the same thing as my father. Because if I'm working and bringing in the money and you're sitting at home, your job is at home. So when I come home, your, my dinner should be ready. Don't call me to wash a dish. This is your, your department. If I want to do it voluntary, that's fine. But if I'm working and I'm bringing in all the money so you could be home with the children, then I would expect you to cook for me, clean for me, and take care of me. But if you're working, I'm working, the roles change. That means I've got to get up and help you with the children. I've got to dress them, wash them, and clean them, and do the school runs if I have the ability to do the school runs. That means when we come home, we're both going to get to it and get in the kitchen. And when it comes to bedtime, we're both going to, while you're doing the dinner, I'm reading about the bedtime stories. I'm reading the script. I'm washing the kids while you get the dinner ready or vice versa, whoever is best at cooking. Yeah. 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 Is that right? Yes, yes. So, but if you're, if you're still living in the old realm yeah. where your father stayed home, your father worked, your mother stayed home, and now you're wanting your wife to work and then come home and do everything as well, you're out of order. Your marriage is not going to last. You've got to make sure that the workload is shared. Your wife is not a slave. Slavery is over. Amen. That's good. I like that. That was very good. Hmm. So that was what role did the, what role did, because our fathers played different roles in our lives. My dad was totally the opposite to his father. So what I saw modeled in my father, uh, my dad, even to this day, you know, will still go and make us tea and toast. When we in were bed. Ki- in bed, he'd bring us tea, he'd bring us breakfast in bed. My father always dad, cooked. Dad, you spoiled them. <laughs> When they, when they, even Seriously, my thanks, children Brad, go thanks, around thanks, there, Brad, and he Dad. still, he still does that to this day. So we had different images of a, the role of a man when we got married, and trust me, it caused some problems because I thought he was. Um, <laughs> We're all well, entitled was, to dream. I thought he was very. Um, what's the word? For me. What's the word? Old school. Chauvinistic is the word I was looking for. Chauvinistic. I had, a, I had issues because I was, my father is the humblest man. He has no problem picking up a mob, a broom, a spoon and cook. He, he would do anything. So I saw, I viewed him as um, very old manly. school. Manly. No, no, that's not, not the manly. right word, no. Manly so that, you know, that in our early days, that caused a lot of problems, trust Lots me, because I wasn't having that. You know we'd, how we do when we get married. I wasn't having it. And as far as I was concerned, I wanted him to be like how my daddy was. <laughs> and we, we've got there. We've got the balance. And I, I, I believe that we've portrayed a, good, a run, good balance. Is, sh- hold on, hold on. I have Hold on, this runs right there. Wait a minute, wait. Who makes the bed every morning? Oh, whatever. Who ma- no, no, no. It's not whatever. No, 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 no. Well, I'm, I'm usually out first. No, I get... no, no, no. You're We're still in it. No, You're no, still no, in no, it. No, 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 no. For the cameras. <laughs> and everyone watching around the world. Yes. Who makes the bed? He does. No, can you don't say it in that could... voice. Just say it more like you just said it. When you said you wanted to be like your daddy. Who makes the bed? He makes the bed now, but he doesn't cook. He doesn't bake, and that's not going to happen. So, okay, I'm not looking for that one. Would you like me to try? No, no, no. You no. see, that's why I don't do it. No. You see, if she wanted me to, I would give it a go. I remember one time, he done. He doesn't know this, so I've never. T- he made a chicken casserole. I think I can't remember if I'd had a baby or some reason he was cooking. And he really tried. 
<laughs> he really tried. He done it in one of those oven dishes that you put it in. I was in a pot, I can't remember, but he put so much stuff in it. It was loaded with vegetables and he cooked it and cooked it and cooked it. <laughs> to, you know when chicken falls apart? <laughs> Listen. And it was thick and I was trying to eat it. <laughs> and I was like, I was just like, pray. And he's like watching me. <laughs> like, are you loving it? I was like, it's lovely. It's really nice. <laughs> That's, that's the first time I've heard that story. So, <laughs> I, see, I believe it. If you do anything, well, that's not do his well. gift. If what? you're gonna cook chicken, cook it well. <laughs> let, let the chicken know his life is over. <laughs> There's no resurrection in, after this one. Okay. All right. So we know your cooking's not could, your forte. Could, if you just excuse me, I'm just gonna go over there <laughs> and just just weep for a moment. And what role, what role do, did the mother play? Because it will tell you what kind of woman she is, and it will tell you how he will treat you. If he saw his father disrespect his mother, more than likely he's going to do the same. And it's, it's not a negative, but you, we are what we see modeled. And if he saw his father and his, the, his mother oppressed and beaten down and, and pushed down, very much so he's going to put that on you. And you need to know these questions. You need to observe those things for yourself. But, sorry, can I just say this as well? Ladies, <clears throat> one of the things you should look at is the way your husband or even your husband now or your husband to do, to be, how he treats his mother. Yes. Yeah. That, listen to me, mm. that tells you everything about him. Mm. I believe every son should take care of their mother. Mm. Every son. I, I'm not talking about letting the mother control you. Mm. I'm not talking about... Um, well, they're dictating dictate to you. Dictate or yeah. tell you who you should marry or when you're married, tell you what your wife should do, when you should have children, mm -hmm. what you should name the children. I don't believe naming children has anything to do with any parent. Mm -hmm. that, that's reserved for, when I say parent, I'm talking about grandparents then. That's reserved for the mother and the father mm -hmm. to make that decision. <clears throat> now, if a man treats his mother with respect... I'm not talking about tied to apron strings. Because some men, you need to, you're, you're big enough now to have walked away from your mother's apron. You shouldn't be still hanging on, mummy, mummy, mummy. Uh, you're 50 years old, mummy, mummy, mummy. <clears throat> I'm talking about, as a man, every man, you should respect your mother. Today, your mother should have got, or tomorrow, your mother should get something from you. Her birthday should be a special occasion. Christmas, your mother, if she's on her own, should never have to be on her own. Because if I married, if my mother was a widow or my mother was divorced and living on her own and I'm marrying her now, I would let her know, I love you, I will always love you, but my mother's on her own. And I want you to know before I go anywhere, I promise I'm going to take care of my mother. My mother, as long as I have money, will never lack. My mother, I'm not leaving my mother. I hear the mother. questions. Does that mean mother has to come and move in with us? No, it doesn't. <clears throat> no, I'm talking about drawing the boundaries. Exactly. We need I'm to define that. I'm talking about respecting her. Mm. And I said, she does not take over your home, yeah. your family, or your life, or your wife. But there's boundaries. Mum, this is, this is your boundary. When my mother wrote me a card... It says to Douglas and family, I went back to her and said, just in case you didn't know, mum, the family's name is Erica, Sarah, Michelle, Danny. If you don't know their names, ask me and I'll remind you. But I draw boundaries. My mother has never, well, one time she slept at our house. She had Alzheimer's disease and she would just, she come and she slept with us and she would just say, woo, 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 the alarm going off at night. And she's walking around the house because she wasn't all there. But when they're in their right mind, they don't come and stay in your house. And now, they could come for a night at Christmas, but they don't come in indefinitely. Three is, three is definitely a crowd. And two is company. So we draw boundaries. And, but as a man, I've always taken care of my mother. I've always taken care of my father as much as to my ability. So if you're a man, ladies, listen to me. If a man cannot love the woman that gave birth to him, you do not stand a chance. 
if the woman who raised him and loved him, and listen, you, you may, listen, your mother may not have been the best mother in the world. She may have beaten you. Yes, I understand. I got that too. But she's still your mother. My mother did everything to divide us. My family did everything to divide us. And I watched my wife. I could not believe when we, she would still do for my mother. She would still, I would say, let me go by myself. She says, no, I'll come with you. When we went to St. Vincent to see my mother, she's there with my mother. And after, tw that was 21 years of marriage. And my mother eventually said to me, you know, son, you married the right woman. 21 years. Takes long as a slow train coming, but boy, I arrived eventually. She says, you, you married the right woman. 21 years. You know why? Because my wife loved her. And some of you women, you're trying to divide your, the family. You want all of the money. You want all of the attention. You are making a rod for your back. Because if the man, you must, and I'm not talking about a Jezebel mother, get me. I'm not talking about a manipulative mother. I'm talking about a mother that's neutral, a mother that has no agenda, yeah. a mother that's not trying to tell you how to live your life, not manipulating your marriage or your relationship. I'm talking about a mother that stands as a strong woman, whether she's saved or unsaved, but you respect that woman and you love that woman yeah. and take care of her. Amen. Moving on to the next um, point. We're still, we are, we're still in dating. We haven't even thought, talked about marriage yet. Let's l learn not to bring the subject up until we're absolutely, absolutely 100% sure. So the next thing we're looking for is, is a visionary. What have they achieved in their life? This is, the scripture says, by their fruit, you shall know them. There is no way that I can be on planet Earth for 54 years and I have got nothing to show for it. What does vision do? It tells you whether that person is, is a visionary or not. Because if I'm just happy to do nothing with my life, it says I'm not a visionary. Visionary are people that go out and achieve. Because when you have a vision, you're, you're seeing something out there and you pursue it and you accomplish it. And when you probably accomplish that one, you look for something else to go on to. So visionary is somebody that's done something with their lives. So if I'm 54 and I've never learned to drive, um, I'm still waiting at bus stops, um, I've never bothered to um, get a proper career, I've got nothing to show for it, what, what, what I've achieved is on my back, I'm not a visionary. So even though we may like to lump that into being materialistic, it's not at all. Because how else am I going to tell from outward whether it, what's on the inside of you? There's no point you tell it because there are dreamers. And they're visionaries. The difference between a dreamer, the dreamer talks all of the stuff, but the visionary does it. A dreamer talks about one day I'll have the house, one day I'll have the car, one day I'll have my driver's license, one day I'll achieve that, but they never do. 10, 20, 30 years goes by and nothing's changed. So the difference between being a dreamer and a visionary, and you need to know which one he or she is, is what they've achieved. Because if you're truly a visionary, you're going to make it happen. Proverbs says, where there's no vision, the people perish. Mm -hmm. So when you get married, you, you talk, you're falling. You, if you're a woman, you're falling somebody. Because this is the head of your home. This is the head of your life. So if he, has no, if he doesn't know where he's going, where are you going? Where, where are you headed? We went, we went abroad this week, and we had a sat-nav in Italy that didn't know its way around. And you're following it. It says, turn left, 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 left. That brings us back to where we are. <laughs> and you turn left, it says, turn right, right, right. And, and in the end, I, I was going to throw the thing out of the car. The thing had no idea of where it was going. And a lot of people are like that, especially mm. men. Mm. We think we just get married and that's it. No, mm. I'm a leader. Mm. I've, got to, I've got to take my family somewhere. Yes. I've got to have a long-term vision. Where yeah. are we going? Yeah. What is our goal? What, what do we write the vision down? Make it plain. Mm -hmm. Men, you should be letting your wife know the vision. This is what we're going to achieve. Mm -hmm. We want a one-bedroom flat. Then after that, we're not going to have children yet. We will do this together. We'll agree on it. Mm -hmm. Don't surprise me. 
Whoops, something to tell you. Don't do that to me now. We've not saved up anything yet. We don't have anything yet. We've not even been on a holiday yet. We don't even know each other yet. You're bringing a third person into our lives and we don't know each other yet. That's too soon, girl, too soon. We're headed this way. This is our direction. We're going to get a flat. You're going to get your driving license because you're not standing no bus stop with my children. Get your life. You, you're afraid? Get rid of your fear. God's not giving us a spirit of fear, but power and love and the ability to drive. Amen. We are we're headed somewhere. Amen. We're going to get a one bedroom. Then after that, you're going to get your, get your job. You're going to go back to college. You're not going to work for Tesco's checkout. Even, even now in supermarket, you don't even need somebody. I even do it myself. Bleep, bleep. For, for your little product. You're going to go back to college, girl. You're going to educate yourself. Then when you get yours, I'm going to raise my value. I'm going to do night school. I'm going to do a study course. We're going to raise our value. Because when, we, when you stop to have children, I don't need pressure on us. And I don't need you giving a child mind £120 a week. Can, so I, you, can I just... You know, one of the things um, I find, if, if, a guy, if a person is lazy, they're not a visionary. Mm. Um, you can't be a visionary and be a lazy person because to, to run with a vision, you've got to be prepared to put in what you need to but put in to accomplish it. The dream, dream is lazy. That's a dream. I saw one guy who was years ago, mm. <clears throat> he would be in a recording studio, he'd be music, or him and his friends in the garage all day playing guitar, playing guitar. We're going to make an album, ping, ping. I went with them to, to clubs where they would go ping, 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 and the people go, boo, get off, boo, get off. That's a good sign. You're not, your calling is not ping, ping, ping. And you know what? He's probably near 60 now. He's still doing the same thing. Lost his home, lost his family, lost everything, and still dreaming of playing this guitar. It's not going to happen. And that's the difference between a dreamer and a visionary. Yes. The visionary will, is active. Mm. The dreamer talks the, the talk, but he never walks the walk. You can't be dreaming of, of buying a four-bedroom house and you don't even get a job. You can't be dreaming of holidays when you won't even get out of your bed. Yeah, yeah. You, you, the Bible tells you if you want to be poor, it gives you instruction what you want to do if you want to be poor. What to do? Close your eyes and fold your arms. Yeah. Turn around and sleep, Proverbs yeah. chapter 6. Yeah. Your, your poverty will come up on you, you won't even know. He tells you what to do if you want to prosper. He says, if, if you want to prosper, trust the Lord with all your heart. He says, be diligent in business. Don't be slothful. If, you, if, you, if you're unemployed, get up and go find a job. It takes away your manhood and your family's respect for you. Uh, we've all been unemployed at some stage. But you, you stay there, something is wrong. So what we do, you know what I do? I'll take anything to get my manhood back on track. And while I'm working, listen, I've done jobs, I've minicabbed from five in the evening on a Friday night till 12 midday the next day. And I slept in my car for two, three hours because we wanted our home. I've, I've undersealed cars where before they had all this waxing in cars, I'd spray cars underneath, drill holes in them and underseal it, underseal, dropping, I had a paper mask and I'd get on the bus walk, going home with underseal, black underseal all over my face. I've done things that I would never have wanted to do, but you know what? It kept my manhood going and it kept my wife's respect for me because every week I'm able to come and say, this is for the food. You can't be a man and put your wife to work and you stay at home. Yeah. It won't work. Yeah. And you know, it's, 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 a, it's a wrong balance if we the women are the ones running with a vision for the family. It's, it's not enough for you, well, you know, I've got all the vision. That's the wrong order. God put it for the man to be the head of the home, to be the, the leader of the family. So it's important, especially from our perspective, ladies, that you marry somebody that's a visionary. Because if he's not, you're not going anywhere. If he's a visionary, that's, he's taking your family into, into their destiny. And I've, you know, even from, I was 17 when we were dating, and at 17, he owned his own car. So, you know, we have excuses today. We make excuses today. But at 17, he had a... You know, we, we were just starting out. We were just kids starting out in life. But he had something already 18, to show what was on the inside 18, of him. At 18, I paid for half my wedding by myself. At 18 years old. Eight to 18. That's the equivalent of a 90-year-old today. 
Because 18 year olds now, you can't even imagine an 18 year old getting married. Mm. You think you're a child. Mm -hmm. At 18, I, I paid for half of my wedding. I was working every hour of overtime there was. I have always been a provider. It's in my DNA. And I can't relate to men who don't. I don't understand it. Because that's why you're struggling at home. Listen to me, finances will be one of your biggest arguments in your home. Yeah. If, if the bills can't be paid, it's one of the biggest arguments you're going to have. That means you've got to put your hand to the plow. And it's not always taking the job you like. Mm. God knows there's a lot of jobs I've done I didn't like. Mm. I've done jobs where I fell on my knees and cried. This, and God, give me another job. But you know what? I'll do it because I have to put bread on the table. Amen. Let me run through the rest of it for visionary. Are they a finisher or are they a procrastinator? What have they begun but never completed? That's going to frustrate you to no end. Are they a finisher? You need to know that. What things have they started but they never... It's Sorry. great starting out, but it's one thing finishing. That goes very early, you know that. Sorry? You, if, if someone is not a finisher, you'll see it very early, i.e., um, engagement, long, long engagement. You're saying, we're going to get married. When? Mm. When? When I get things right. You never get things right. Yeah. There's always something else to do. Just do what Jesus said. Nike took it. Just do it. And but you know, everything but you know what? If you're place. a finisher, you, it means you stick with something until the job gets done, and that can work in your marriage. If someone's not a finisher, they they're not they're not that commitment's not there. But they will go for divorce. Yeah. Because you're not a finisher. That means if I'm a finisher, I, I this is what I do. I hate taking today's work into tomorrow, because I figure if I do what I need to do today, tomorrow I still got stuff to do. And I don't have enough time to leave today's work mm. and carry over to tomorrow. Because then I, then I leave tomorrow and carry, then you see you fall behind all the time. So if you're going out, you're waiting for this perfect moment. I'm engaged, but I'm waiting for this perfect moment. I'm waiting till I have X amount of money, and then we're going to get married. Just get married. Mm. Go to registry office and get right before God instead of committing sin. You so I'd rather I'd rather get married. I've seen we've seen weddings where they get married with a Coca-Cola a spring a ring from a Coca-Cola tin, and say with this ring I thee wed, and take that. And after a while, my first wedding ring for you. Do you know how much it was? Did I tell you how much it was? Eighteen. Eighteen pounds. Mm -hmm. Eight. It wasn't like girls today. If it don't bling, I don't want it. <laughs> Eighteen pounds. Eighteen pounds. She still has it. Mm -hmm. She's in, no, it wasn't the same one because I threw that one away when I was mad at you. I, she got me really upset once I threw it out the window and I couldn't find it anymore. Yeah, but that's what, that's what you do when you're young, you argue. So I told you, it's not always going to be a bed of roses. And when you talk about bed of roses, who talk about bed of roses? Roses is prickly. <laughs> but you know, in the young days, you get, you, you're foolish and I threw it out the window because I was upset and I went with metal detector, I've never found it. <laughs> hide metal detector so I went and bought exactly the same thing again and I think this one was 22 pounds she still has it today but you know it started off she doesn't wear that now but some of you you want to start up the top and, and before I know let me jump to this but let me do it while I'm here let's talk about the Jones syndrome the Joneses because some of you this is what some of you are doing some of you young married couples you, you're in this mode of competition you're trying to outdo the next couple. Yeah. You know, I'm going to have this wedding. It's going to be bling, bling, bling. And, and you, we're trying to always outdo somebody. And you, are, you are insane. Well, that, that fell into our category called pride. Wow. It's pride, and um, that's not going to um, profit a marriage. No, I can't compete. You can't, you can't look at us mm. and compete with me. We've been at this a long time. Mm. You can't look at someone who's been married three years and the way they are, you start competing or trying to outdo each other. You're going to run yourself into debt mm. and you drive yourself insane. You, before well, it is, I mean, you could, let's put it this way. I've been married, coming up, we're coming up for 36 years. You can't look at what jewelry I have. Took me 36 years to get this. <laughs> you ain't even married yet. Your eyes are too big. It's called pride. 
this Amen. is what I'm going to do with you. Every jewelry she's ever had, I have it at home. If I put it together, you know those places where you sell gold? We probably wouldn't get 50 pounds for it. That's what it would be. Mm. It probably, it might be, it might be, I might get it valued. But I'm going to bring it next time we do. Next week, we're going to go more into the marriage. But when you put it together, it was little chains. You, you go nine carat gold. You, do you know what I mean? You, you understand the difference? You got nine carat, 24 carat, 18 carat, 24 carat. 24 is a pure one. Yeah, some of you want 24 carat. Mm. And you haven't even got to nine yet. Mm. And because you see someone with a 24 carat or a, a ring. Listen, listen to me. If I'm marrying you, you shouldn't say to me yes based on the size of the ring I give you. Because this one over here got a bling bling ring. You're putting pressure on me to buy you something I can't afford. You should be, if I buy you a ring for 50 pound and that's what I can afford, bless me. And understand, I'm not stopping there because I'm a visionary. I'm going somewhere. But allow no, me the grace to but, grow. But there is a difference with a cheapskate man. No, we're not talking about him, but there are those. Well, we need to mention okay, him because there him. is that cheapskate man. Expose him, go on, um, expose cause him. Because where we started, you know, 17, 18 years old, we didn't have a lot of stuff. So, you know, he, it was always in his heart to, you know, we had visions of buying a flat and then later on buying a, another moving up. So we always had a vision of bettering ourselves over the years. We knew we couldn't come from just having a flat to having that dream house. We knew it was a process over the years that you take on a journey in that vision. And it's the same thing with, with um, jewelry or any other material possession. You start off somewhere. And for me, I would rather live in the dream than be wearing it. That's good. Come on. I should, I should have said Some that. Some of them. I said, yeah. You can is, sorry, have it. Sorry. Go on. You should be, how do you say it again? You should, <laughs> I, I, that. I would rather live in the dream than, be than wearing. wearing the dream. Yeah. I like that. I always say, I, I always used Could to say. Could you edit her saying that out and just put me saying that, please? I always used to say this to Pastor, you know, before we look at fanciful cars, the roof over my head is more important to me. Because, um, you know, the catching up with the Joneses, we're more interested in what people think of us. Impressive but for people. me, I don't want to drive a car and I haven't got a house and I'm renting. Let's buy a house. And later on, as finances, we get stronger in that. Then we can look at getting a decent car. But for me, the house was the most important thing. Not driving around in this big car. Am I going to sleep in it? No, I want somewhere decent. And some of you, you want to wear the deposit. Wow. Our first, our first accommodation. I never had an engagement ring. No, never. Until I don't know when. It was years and years, way over 20 years, I should imagine, before. Never had a honeymoon. No. Some of us, we insist on things, and it's, it's, it's fine if you can do them. I mean, we're t please take into account, we weren't 30 odd at this stage. Some of you are there and you can do better. But 17 and 18, we couldn't afford a lot of stuff. So we were working from the perspective of just being young kids getting married. I think it was married Saturday, back to work on Monday. Mm -hmm. That was it. Yeah. But you know what? You either you pay, now. pay now or pay later. But now, all we need is the kids to go. <laughs> and we would have so much more money. <laughs> Our first accommodation was it my mother and father-in-law. We couldn't do better. You stepped over the bed to get into the bedroom. A few months later, because we didn't want to live with them, we rented a room. In the room, there would be mice running around. Um, we would kill them, tell the landlord they wouldn't do anything about it. Kill it, leave it on the steps. You'd hear the woman walk down, scream, ah! Um, things like that. We, we moved from that, we moved to a, a two-bedroom uh, house association flat uh, on the second floor, no carpet, nothing. We just sat on the, chair. Uh, had, a chair had a chair in front of a heater. Mm. We boiled eggs in a kettle. We couldn't afford the cooker. Mm -hmm. We would heat baked beans, um, steam it. Eventually, we got a cooker on finance from the uh, electricity board. I don't know if they still do that. 
um, and then we were able to cook. That's how we, that's where we came from. But you know, but, that, but this comes back to what I was saying. If you're a visionary, there has to be fruit to show for your life. It didn't matter where we started. We started with nothing. But if we weren't visionaries, we'd still be there. There are a lot of people that we grew up around that was in the same age group, same place as us, and they're still there. So we don't take it for granted we're here. And if you're a visionary, there should be evidence that that's what's in you. It's manifested on the outside. But the man must be a visionary. If both of you could be visionaries, but if a man lacks vision, you're going to perish. Yeah. If a man does not know, for instance, what scripture <clears throat> says. You, you have to have a vision for where you're going to go. Yeah. Where is my family headed in five years? Where are we going to be? And, and this thing with men, you know, men getting offended, Christian men. I've seen men, you get offended and leave church, take your whole family out of church, take them out of their destiny, ruin the children's lives. You must understand our behavior will have, have a, a direct impact yeah. on our children, our children's children. You have to, you, you know, you have got to learn to lead your family by example. And that means you, you, you've got to pay the price and get before God. And if you don't have a vision, ask God for a vision. Ladies, another thing, and men, both of you, another thing you need to know with a man or woman is their money. What people do with money is so important. Your money says everything about you. You will look at someone, listen, if you go on a date... When you're dating somebody, some of you married him and you didn't even pay attention. You go on a date with a man. Dominic is my son, my only son. And I promise you, none of you ever will, but if you ever went on a date with Dominic, I promise you Dominic will never, ever let you pay one single penny towards that bill. And if you go on a date with a man and he's saying to you 50-50, listen, get up from the table Put the money on the table. Say, it's been nice meeting you. Give him the money. I wouldn't even give him 50. I'd pay the whole bill. Give him the money. Say, God bless you. Enjoy your life. Because I will not be in it. And some of you now, you've seen those things and you still married a man. Listen to me. If a man doesn't tithe, some of you might not like this. If a man will not give to God, you don't stand a chance. If a man, see, with me, I'm a giver. I'm a giver all round. I give. You know, I, I, I spoke to a pastor, and I, I'm telling him what we're doing today. I'm sharing with him. I'm, I'm sharing with him what we're doing so he can do it in his church. And he says, you always share your ideas. And I said, but God is not short of them. And that's where I go to, to get them. I go to God, and God gives them to me. So if a man is not generous with money, Ladies, if he's not giving to God, he's not going to give to you. Every man in here, regardless of, regardless of your financial situation, should have bought your wife something for tomorrow. You can't preach that to me because, tell me, things are hard. You, you're talking to the wrong person. I would run from work to get home, and I would stop at the shop every Friday. Every Friday, I'd get a, a Cadbury's fruit and nut bar and a bottle of Tizer appetizer. And I'd take it home. That's all I could afford. So you can't tell me, oh, and she never said to me, is that all? She knew where we were at financially. And so when I brought it home, it wasn't, she didn't need apple tizer, uh, tizer. She didn't need a chocolate bar. She didn't need any of that. But what it is, it was the thought behind what I'm doing. So it's not just, I, 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 that's all I had. You know, I would, I would keep my money and I'd buy a bar of chocolate and a bottle of Tizer and I'd take it home. Didn't I do that for you? And you know what? It, it's, it's what I could afford to give us giving. And obviously, as God prospered me, the gifts got better. But it began as a seed. And if a man is not generous to God, when I heard tithing, I tithe. I, I give to God. I, I walk around. Any money I have in my pocket, I'm always looking for somebody to give it to. And if a man is not giving to God, ladies, you don't stand a chance. Do not marry a tight word. You'd be miserable. But you know what? We, uh, most of the time, we don't watch long enough to find out if these things are evident. Um, I'm in a place where it doesn't matter um, what I want, what I need. If he, if he has it, it's never, it's never withheld. 
Amen? And sometimes we don't want to watch for fruit. We don't want to check for fruit. We don't want to do our homework. And then we end up in a place where we're married, and then we've got to try and fix it. And I know a lot of the stuff we talked about today was in the context of dating. But a lot of it, it flows into marriage. And it may be things that you never... Um, took the time to find out about and those issues or struggles in your marriage now but it's not too late just because you're married you just need to work it out but don't be so desperate you become blind do do you know what I mean it's like um, it's like I told this story when we needed a car for church I was so desperate for a car and a minister who had a Ford Cortina he had it on finance and he damaged it the whole front was damaged and I wanted the car. He says to me, you could take it, but can you keep up the payments? And because I was desperate, I couldn't see the damage. All I could see is me fixing the car. I didn't think about how I'm going to get the money to fix the car or how I'm going to maintain the payments. All I could see was if I get the car, I can fix the car. Some of you like that with relationships. You don't see the dangers or the downside. You just think, if I get him, I can fix him. Or if I get her, I can fix her. And my wife came downstairs under the garage. I'll never forget the moment. It's embedded, or engraved on the table of my heart. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of creamish color, Ford Cortina. It was backed up against the wall. We had an underground car park. And the front of it was there. And she looked at me. And what she said to me, and I've lived by this scripture ever since. She looked at me. She looked at the car. And it was the word of the Lord for me. She said to me, the, the blessing of the Lord, it makes rich and adds no sorrow to it. Based on that, based on that, I called him. He was very upset with me. I said, I don't want your car. Take your car, and I can't keep up. He was trying to dump his junk on me. It was about three or four weeks later. Remember, Ishmael always precedes Isaac. And three or four weeks later, I had no credit. My credit was bad. I'm queuing in the Lord's Bank in Croydon, and I fill out a form for a loan, knowing I wouldn't get it. But when God is on your side, he favors you. And put it in a box. I, didn't, I just dropped it back in the box and forgot about it. I got two or three days later, they said to me, you've been approved for 3,000 pounds, which to you is, back then was a lot of money. I bought myself a black Saab 900 Turbo, which was a true blessing to us. Some of you need to let Ishmael slip by and await Isaac. Because if I'd taken that car, that was the Ishmael trying to rob me of my joy. And some of you, you're saying yes to somebody, and it's got so many dents and bruises and downsides and character flaws, and you're still saying, yeah, but I can fix it. But you can't fix it because you're not God. And some men, even God cannot fix because he only works with willing vessels. You know, uh, um, on closing, there was, I remember watching this um, real reality um, program that used to be on with this lady called Jessica Simpson, I think it was, um, when she was married to her first husband. And um, he sh- I remember him showing her a vacuum cleaner. She said, what is that? And what do you do with it? She'd never seen one before. And he said he had a five-year plan. I think it was a five-year plan um, to, te- to domesticate her, to teach her to be a wife. He had a plan. And we all know the rest of the story. They're divorced today. But you can't go in with a plan to fix a person. They are what they are. Amen? So you can't go in to think, I'm going to change him or I'm going to change her. You're going to make yourselves, both of you, miserable. But some couples, you're sitting here today and you're going through that. You've married, you saw the flaws, you ignored the flaws. Now you're committed. You're in it. What do I do now? I'm in it. I'm here now, I'm in it, what do I do? Well, you know, the one first thing you've got to do is stop trying to change the other person. If, if, I'm, if she irritates me, what I need to do is ask God to change me so I don't get so easily irritated. And if you're in that relationship now and you've got children uh, to divorce, you're going to damage the children uh, as well as yourselves. So I would suggest you bite the bullet and you stick with it, especially if you've got children, you bite the bullet and you both suffer for the rest of your life so your children can have a good life. Stop arguing in front of the children and allow, you've made your mistake, stay with it and then at least be civil so your children can come up in a home that's not broken. And if you want to resolve it, all you've got to do, let me tell you, both of you go in that room, you go in that room, fast and pray, fast and pray, say, God, change my heart. I made a mistake 
I made a mistake. God, I ignored your warnings. Now, oh God, I surrender myself to you. Change my heart and give me a heart that's teachable. Because, you see, we didn't even get to the point where when you go down the aisle, you, you go down, you take a, a, a last journey. Dun, 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 dun. This, this is actually the last rites. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 The minister says, who gives this bride in marriage? The father of the bride says, I do. The minister says, sir, please take your bride and step forward. At that moment, there's a dying. Husband or wife-to-be, husband-to-be, there's a death right there. Something that's never existed now is birthed. You're no longer Douglas. You're no longer Erica. You are now Douglas and Erica. The mystery is that two become one. That means we become somebody that has never existed before. That means my attitude, her attitude has to change. That means we cannot think as single people anymore. We are no longer, I'm no longer the bachelor. So everything about us has to change, including attitude. So I can no longer see myself as an individual. And this is where some of you are struggling. You're still trying to be the bachelor married. You're still trying to be the boy or the girl hanging out with your friends. And yet you are not that person anymore. That person go back to wherever you got married and their corpse is laying there. You're now a brand new person. You are connected to somebody. Therefore, you cannot be by yourself. So it's no longer what about me. It is what about us. You get that? So when we come up to the altar, now when you see me, you see her. When you see her, you see me. Because we're one. Every time I'm not in church, you, you feel something missing. Because we're not together. When you see her, when you see me and you don't see her, something is missing. Because part of me is not here. Part of her is not here. Because we're one. You get that? So that means we can't think like single people anymore. We have to think as, as, as a couple. We've taken on a new role, a new identity. You get that? I'm not, we, she's not miss anymore. She's missus. We are not single, we are married. That means we're accountable to each other. She has the right to ask me, where have you been? She has the right to say, can I look at your phone, please? I, sh I cannot have a locked phone. Why am I locking my phone? Why do I have codes on my computer? We're one. So I have access to your computer, same as you have access to mine. Why are you locking your phone, my brother? When we lock something, it's because we're hiding something. Whatever reason you give, we only lock things because we want to hide. If we're open and honest, we don't care who sees what we have. Ooh, that's deep stuff. So every wife should have access to a husband's phone. He should say, he sh you should not hide your phone when you go home. You should be able to leave your phone laying around, let him look or her look at your phone and vice versa. Our phones, her phone's by her bed, my phone's by my bed. If it rings, she can answer it. If her phone rings, I can answer it. I don't because it's usually a woman that wants to talk long. But generally, generally, we could answer each other's phones. It shouldn't be a conversation where you have to say, I can't get back home. <laughs> do, do you see what I mean? It should be honest and open because we're now one. Stand your feet with me today. I hope this has blessed you. <laughs> Amen. Now, I want to do something. Um, I want to pray for the married couples. If you're married, I want to pray for you. Not if you... 
I'm not talking about traditional marriage. If you've done a tradition, you're not married, just in case you think you are. One woman left the church because I told her she's living in fornication because she did a, a Zimbabwean traditional here and she's living with the man. If you've done a traditional wedding, you are not married before God. You're not married. And if you do anything, you're, you're living in sin. But if you're properly married before God, I want to pray for you. Come. Which we'll let them all come to the front. It's going to be a crowd. Come with your partner if you can. Hold hands. Sound, sound, sound. Thank you. Come in, come in, press in, go around the side. Go around the side. Squeeze round, go all the way round, squeeze round. Where's my cameraman? Should be up here with me. Come in. Squeeze in, squeeze in. Let me say this to you, married couples. Let me say this to you. Your attitude will determine your marriage. It's so simple. I, I was in safari a couple of years ago, and, you know, I was using my phone, and there's nothing in the, this wilderness, just desert, this, not desert, just wilderness. I'm on my phone, and the driver says to me, Mr. Goodman, if you'd like to use your phone, just tell me I'll pull over. Pull over? I'm in an open Jeep. There's just bush. I didn't get it. And I, another time, I didn't, well, I didn't understand. You pull over. Why would you pull over in the bush? People use the bush for toilet. And you're going to put, uh, then another time, he says, Mr. Goodman, so I've asked you, please, if you need to make a call, tell me I'll pull over. And I realized what he wanted me to do was put my phone away. I understood his language. He wanted me to put my phone, I put my phone in the safe. I took everything, I put everything in the safe. And you know, when I got rid of the technology, I was out there and I had an experience with God. I know, I don't even know what it was or how it was, but I had an experience with God. And I heard myself say this. I said, I give up the right to be right. In other words, I'm not going to argue about things that has no value. And that's what I've been doing. I said, I give up the right to be right, so I'm not going to argue about things that has no value. Because we can argue about stupid things and, and actually create problems in our lives over stupid things. So now I see things and I just let it slide. I just don't argue about it. And I'm saying to you today, give up the right to be right. There's not everything. When you're young, you argue about everything. But when you get older and mellow, they say to me, you're not, you, with Dominic, you're different. With, actually, you, you treat him so soft. I've mellowed. That, that doesn't bother me anymore. You know what? There's more to life than arguing. So we give it, and now we, we hardly, hardly, hardly ever argue. You know why? Because I've given up the right to be right. And by me stepping back from every argument, it has now brought a tremendous peace to our lives because I found I was generating a lot of the strife because I would fight about everything. So I, I encourage you now, would you lift your hands with me? Hold each other. This is the time. Don't separate. In fact, why don't you face each other a little bit? Remember you in church when you face each other. Just face each other. I want to pray for you today. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what you're going through. But I do know in this room today, there's marriages that are in danger. And unless you change, Satan's going to take your home and your family from you. You must be willing to change. So will you lift your hands? Father, I've seen men in this church last year who've come to a place that is beyond belief because they decided to change. Father, I lift up every marriage here before you. We lift up these marriages before you, Father God. And Father, we bind every unclean spirit 
that has infiltrated any area of these marriages. We bind the spirit of divorce and separation from their lives. Father, we pray your peace and your blessing upon them. We pray, Father God, that you'll do something in their hearts. Lord God, you'll cause them to fall in love as never before. Any doors that's been opened, we pray, Father, you'll close it now in the name of Jesus. And we pray, Father, that whatever the enemy has tried, that you'll turn it around for their good. I speak peace over your life. I speak the blessings of God over your life. I pray that God will cause you to fall in love over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. As you embrace each other, hold each other. And I release now in your life peace and joy. I release in your life now harmony. I bless your home. I bless your families. And I pray God's favor upon you. We pray that God will use you as an example to the nations of the world to show what a Christian marriage submitted to God should look like. Father, we thank you for them and we bless them and we thank you there's not one barren womb here. But God, you open every womb and bless them in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen to me, families, couples. It's not just about you. Because what you do today with your life doesn't just affect you. My children are standing here in church today because of the way we are. My grandson has been following me around for the last, since yesterday I got back. He's been following me all day, playing with me because I have that relationship with him. And he loves God. He loves God because of the way we live. So it's not just for you. It's the generations to come. And you know what? Today, before you leave here, don't leave here and go back. Because when we do marriage counseling, people are always trying to say, yeah, but you did. Yeah, but you said. Do what Paul says. This one thing I do. You have to leave it right here at the altar and go back to your homes with a new mindset and stop going back over this need to talk about the past. The past cannot help your future. You leave here with a decision. You know what? Let's lay it down. Leave it at the cross. And let's go back to our seats. Let's go back to our homes with a new, new zeal, a new energy, a new life. Start looking to the future. You've hurt me and I've hurt you. But talking about it is not going to help us. Let's talk about our future. I, 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 I give up the right to be right. Holidays. Sometimes I say, we've got to go here. Now all the kids are involved. Let's go here. Let, whatever you want. As long as it's not where there's no British influence, like China or those funny countries where they could lock you up for life and no one knows you're gone. <laughs> as long as they don't take me to those places. Take me where I can call the British government to help me, and I, we will go. Amen? Let's lift our hands and thank God. Father, we thank you, and we praise you. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in these families. Thank you, Father, the devil is bound. That spirit of divorce and separation has left them. Father, any doors they've opened to their homes, we take authority over every unclean spirit that has entered into their homes. We bind you. We command you to leave their homes now in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray you'll, you'll release in their homes a spirit of joy, a spirit of peace, a spirit of harmony, Father. And let your angels inhabit their homes. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go forth. Be blessed. Amen. Multiply. Amen. And replenish the earth. Amen. Amen. You're doing a good job. <laughs> Amen. At the end, at the end, at the end. I'm doing all to go first. You want to stay? You can go if you want.
As you get back to your seat, could we all stand? We want to give everybody in this building today an opportunity to know Christ as their Savior. Would everyone stand for me just for a moment, please, as we go back to our seats? The most important part of any service, <clears throat> anything we do, the most important part is that we come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Um, what Eleanor did today for the young lady who's not even here, is, you see, what is, what is, the thing is, what you sow, your seed will follow you, even though she's not here. And that kind of act only comes from a heart that loves God. Because most people would never think of buying something for somebody, they'll buy it for themselves. So today, I want to invite you <clears throat> to, in, to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know, many of us go through life presuming that at this time we will go to this destination. Many of us go through lives presuming that automatically heaven will be our home because we're good people, because we don't drink, we don't smoke, we don't sleep around, we don't do drugs. You know, many people believe that just by being good will get us into heaven. Well, it doesn't really work that way because Jesus said, except a man be born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of heaven. Listen to me, folks. If all we had to do was be a good person, why would Jesus Christ have gone to the cross and died such a terrible death if all I had to be was good? See, I heard that same thing. I, I would go to the hospital with my children and they'll say to me, what religion are you? And I said, Church of England, because it was the easiest to pronounce, C of E. But I found out that one day a couple of ladies came to our house, our flat, and told us about Jesus. And they said, pray this prayer with us. And when we prayed that prayer, something happened inside of us. It changed not just our lives, it changed our destiny. And we prayed that simple prayer, it goes like this. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I repent of my sins. Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior from this day forward. The moment we prayed that prayer, we were on the verge of a divorce. When we prayed that prayer, Jesus came into our hearts and into our lives. Everything changed. I had a, my daughter here was in hospital dying and God healed her. Everything in our lives changed because we said yes to Jesus. Today, I don't know where you're at, but I know Jesus is here today. I want to pray a simple prayer with you today. That same prayer they prayed with me. And I know there's a lot of people here. And there'll be things going through your mind saying, not today, put it off for tomorrow. Maybe next week, maybe next month. The problem with that is none of us know just how long we have left on this earth. There are people alive today that will not see tomorrow. So you choose life. The Bible says, today is the day of salvation, right now. And I want to pray that prayer with you. If you'd like me to pray that prayer, you'd like to receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, I want to pray with you right where you stand. You say, that's me, preacher. Pray with me. Would you lift your hand above your head? Nothing to be embarrassed about. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. God bless you down there. Today's your day. I see you down there. Today's your day. Don't leave here without making peace with Him. You say, I belong to religion. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Protestant. I'm an Anglican. Do you know, folks, there's no religion in heaven. Religion was made by man. The qualification for heaven is not religion. The qualification for heaven is you must be born again. What happens when I'm born again is I've accepted God's forgiveness for my sin. I've accepted everything that Christ did on the cross for me. I'm now forgiven. My name is entered into the Lamb's book of life, not because of my good works, but because of what he did. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works lest any man should boast. We can't save ourselves. We need a savior. So I want to pray with you. Is there anybody else today? You say, pray for me. 
Raise your hand high so I can see it. God bless you. I see your hand. Anybody else? I see your hand. I see your hand. It's your choice. Today's your day. I'm going to pray now. Would you bow your heads with me? And would you pray this prayer from your heart with me and say with me, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I repent of my sins. Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Look, thank you for watching this program. We pray it's been a blessing to you. If you'd like more information on V2V Church, please log on to our website, which is www.v2vchurch.org. That's www.v2vchurch.org. Or you can call us on our free phone number, which is 08000 That's 08000 Our services are every Sunday, 11 a.m. And we have our youth service at 3 p.m. and our midweek service, which is on Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. So we look forward to seeing you. Hope you have an amazing day. God bless you. God bless you.